All right, so I think we will get going because we actually do have a, my guess is we do have a bunch of stuff to cover and we had great questions coming in with the registration. So thank you everyone. So we're here today obviously to talk about the paid family and medical leave. Um, I know we've been talking about it for the better part of almost 18 months now, but we're just three short weeks away from this starting. Um, and we want to make sure that you have everything you need to, to get your policies written internally so that when an employee does go out on leave, um, you're not necessarily making decisions reactively. You have some of those decisions made beforehand. So as always, we want to make sure that you are consulting with your professionals that you work with, uh, with your company, whether it be your brokers, et cetera. We're more than happy to help. So if, you know, feel free to reach out to the Rogers Gray team or to Jen, who's joining us again today, if you do have any questions regarding any of these. So Jen, obviously, thank you again for joining. I know we've done a bunch of these this year and we're gonna do it again. Um, but I think really this whole topic started uh, with a conversation with Jen and I, some really good questions had come in from clients um, about what happens with PFML around situation X. And there are a lot of those different type of situations. So what we're gonna try to do is go through a lot of them today but as jen and i were talking that was earlier this week i think i left the conversation and jen you can correct me if i'm wrong i left the conversation with a lot more questions on top of the questions that we already had and just based on the conversations that i was having i thought it, it really probably made sense to make sure that we got ahead of these questions rather than waiting for someone to go out on leave in 2021 and then have to decide you know how to handle that setting a precedent in real time versus spending a little bit of time to think about what would work best for you and your company. So, you know, Jen, is that, is that a fair assessment of, of kind of how our conversation went earlier this week? It is, Jeff. So I think, I think building the, the PFML policy, you know, that's really the topic for today. So as, as we all know, we do need to have a PFML policy within our handbook and our, our HR documents so that, you are setting some of these precedents and answering these questions. Um, but I think one of the questions that has been out there is, is there a model policy? Is there a template? Is there something that we can review so we can add it to our handbook? And as far as I know, there isn't a, a quote unquote model policy for PFML. So I know Jen and her team have been great. They've helped a bunch of our clients build their policies. Um, you know, that does come at a cost, you know, Jen and her company do that. So for any one of the Rogers Gray clients or the, the people that are joining our webinar here, it's $500 to have Jen put a policy in place for you, build that, that PFML policy. So that's something that obviously she's more than happy to do for anybody. I just wanna, I know we got a bunch of questions on what does a model policy look like? Um, and there really isn't one out there. So that's, that, that's the first thing we kind of to get off of, um, get off the table to start. But Jen, do you want to jump in and just maybe kind of talk about just an overview of, of the policies in general? And then we're going to spend most of our time on the slide where it talks about the different leaves. Absolutely. So as far as building your own policy, to the extent that you don't want to retain counsel to do so, I'm going to give you some helpful hints and some tidbits that you can all take away from today's webinar so that if you are inclined, you can try to draft your own policy. Obviously, we always recommend having it reviewed by counsel because you want to make sure it's legally compliant with the current regulations and the law. So we, we certainly recommend that. But I know many of you are quite savvy and you have read the regulations yourselves and you've attended many webinars. So you may be up to the challenge. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that your policy should include. Obviously, just a general overview of PFML and what PFML could potentially entitle an employee to. And we've talked about this in previous webinars, but what the paid family leave is, what the paid medical leave is, how many weeks employees could potentially take those leaves and for what purposes they could take those leaves. Obviously, your policy should outline those items. Something that's very important that your policy should outline is um, intermittent leave, which we've had some questions on from our clients recently that have asked us, do we have to provide intermittent leave under PFML? And the answer is, it depends. So for a serious health condition, the answer is yes, you must provide an employee with intermittent leave. Then the question is, well, what about bonding leave? The answer is, 
only if the employer and the employee agree, then you have to provide intermittent leave. So only if you want to, do you have to provide intermittent leave for bonding leave purposes. So my recommendation at this point would probably be not to provide intermittent leave because I think that it would be a very difficult uh, administrative burden for the company if you provided intermittent leave for bonding leave purposes, but you are going to be required to provide it for serious health condition. So your policy obviously wants to state in what instances you will provide intermittent leave. And you also have to define what your company considers to be intermittent. So the regulations have said you need to provide intermittent leave consistent with how you allow for other leaves. Obviously, most people in Massachusetts allow for at least hour increments because our Massachusetts sick leave law provides that you have to allow for hour increments. And so typically most policies you see will have our increments in them. Some companies have come to me and said, well, can I have eight hours be my intermittent leave? And while the regulations don't say you can't, I would suggest that given current law and relying on FMLA, which is obviously has many similar um, analogies to PFML, um, I would say eight hours is not intermittent. And so I would certainly suggest something less than that because I, I don't think eight hours would be intermittent. So you need to think about what that is. The department has said that they're going to allow employees to file claims in 15 minute increments, but an employee won't be allowed to file a claim until after they've accrued eight hours of that 15 minute increment block. So again, intermittent leave needs to be addressed in your policy. I think that that's certainly clear. The next thing that should be addressed is notice of leave. Are you going to require employees to give notice? The law allows you to require 30 days prior written notice if the leave is foreseeable, meaning a planned leave. So that is something you should have in your policy if you're going to require that. And then obviously, if it's an emergency situation, it's as soon as practicable. Um, and then failure to provide notice of leave can be grounds for delaying PFML. So that should be in your policy that if they don't give you proper leave, you can, you can delay uh, PFML and you will notify the department that you didn't receive notice as required by your policy. In addition, you can require that the employee schedule things to best suit your needs. The regulation explicitly states that. So your policy should also notify employees that when scheduling planned medical treatments or procedures that are non-emergent, that they should schedule them to best suit the needs of the employer. So that way, if they don't, you can point to the policy and try to have a conversation with them around potentially moving that elective procedure. The next thing is that the notice should state the type of leave, the anticipated length of leave, and the expected return date. And then you should also let the employees know where the notice should be sent, that the notice should be in writing, whether it's electronic or otherwise, and who the notice should be provided to. So are you going to have the employee notify HR? Are you going to have them notify an office manager? Are you going to have them notify the president, the CEO? I mean, who are you going to have these people notify of their leave? So all of that should be contained in your policy. The next thing, obviously, that you want to consider having in your policy is related to reporting while on leave. So obviously, you want to make sure that if somebody's on leave, they're required to update you regularly, and you need to decide what those intervals are. I would recommend you know, weekly or biweekly. While they're out on leave, they're updating you as to when they're going to be returning, unless you know that the length of their leave is going to be a certain time frame. So you should have that in your policy. The next thing which Jeff and I have had conversations about with some of our mutual clients is benefits. So the law says that you must provide health insurance benefits and carry those benefits under the same terms and conditions as when the employee was not on leave. What that means is the employer remains liable for their portion of the premiums, as does the employee. So in, in a situation where the employer pays 50% and the employee pays 50%, that would continue while the employee is out on leave, that obligation. So you as a company need to decide how you're going to handle that. Are you going to require the employee to pay those premiums while they're out on leave? And if you are going to require it, 
how are you going to have them remit them? Is there some way they can do so electronically? Are you going to require a money order, a check? Who are they going to send it to? If they don't do it, you want to notify them in your policy that if they don't pay the premiums while they're out on leave, their health insurance will be terminated. So you want to make sure that your policy is explicit and it's clear that if they don't send in the payments, they will be terminated. Now, you don't have to have them pay while they're on leave. You could also have them um, have a wage deduction upon their return. Jeff, did you want to interject something here? No, I'm sorry. I just had a question did come through, but I'm going to actually hang on to it for a minute. Okay, so, so the other thing you could decide to do is have it done through wage deduction after they return. Obviously, the risk there is that for some reason they don't return. So you could increase the wage deduction when they come back, but you're risking that if they don't come back, you would have paid the coverage during the time they were out. So those are a few things that you certainly want to make sure are addressed in the policy. And then reporting back to work is going to be very important. If they're out for their own serious health condition, you want your policy to explicitly state that you're going to require medical certification from a healthcare provider showing that they're fit to return to work. So certainly that should be included and that they're not going to be able to return until that documentation is provided. So that's a very, uh, that's a very high level overview, but it's to give you all some context and some of the things that you should be thinking about if you are intending to draft your own and build your own PFML policy. Um, you want to make sure that you're considering all of the things that we just went over. And I'm sure some of you might have questions, so feel free to send them in on the chat. Yeah, and Jen, I think that just speaks to the need where, you know, a lot of questions, not, not necessarily so far today, but just in general have come in is, is there a model policy? And I, I just think based on all of the variables, it's, it's really hard to have one policy that fits everyone's specific needs. And we've even talked, we've talked specifically about differences between being within the state plan for PFML and being on the private side, because we're actually finding that, you know, the private carriers obviously are at least doing what the state is requiring them to do. But we're finding out that in some scenarios, you can you can do things a little bit differently that if you wanted to provide a different type of benefit to your employees where it's enhanced from where the state is. So, again, there there really is no particular one size fit all type of policy that that everyone can just use, throw in their handbook. And, and that that makes sense for their their company. It really is a, a strategic conversation with someone like Jen. Um, and so, Jen, if so, so this question came in, so I just wanted to ask it. We might as well ask it now. But so, if someone wanted to to have you write their their PFML policy, can you just just quickly kind of go through what order of operations looks like? Is it is it a phone call, then then a then the drafting, or what does it look like? If someone wanted to have you write their policy, you know, what would be the steps to make that happen? Yeah, typically, if I'm not familiar with the size of the entity and, and the, the individuals in the entity, then I would want to have a phone call with the company and find out some of the questions that we kind of went over when we're talking about drafting. You know, who would the individuals report to? How far in advance would the company want to know um, about a leave? Uh, what type of intermittent requirements are there currently in place? So do they allow hour increments? Do they allow 15 minute increments? How does that work? So I would want to kind of run through some of the, the checklist items that I have as questions. And then I, then I have what I consider a model policy that then I make so that it applies to that particular company. So I have the bare necessities in there and then I beef it up with the specifics for that particular company. Okay, and the, the turnaround time on that, is that something obviously, you know, schedules have to ma match up to have that initial call, et cetera, but is it a couple days, is it a week? What, what would that normally take? Yeah, I mean, usually it's a few days. Obviously right now we're heading into year end and I have a list of handbooks um, that I'm going to be updating for our clients. So it's going to be a really busy push till the end of the year because everybody wants to roll things out 1-1-2021 uh, with the new PFML. Okay. And then is there anything else? So as you're looking at that type of policy, is there anything else ancillary within other company policies? I know we're going to get into other leaves. So excluding other types of leaves that might have to be um, adjusted. Is there anything else within, I know like job descriptions around PFML are important. Is there anything else that 
that should be on someone's radar outside of just the PFML policy specifically? I think job description job descriptions are certainly important and we've talked about the importance of them in prior webinars. Obviously the actual PFML policy, all of your other leave policies, and, and if you have any sort of sick leave banks or extended illness banks or anything like that. And then just taking an overall look at your how you handle PTO and, and how that's going to interplay with um, the paid family medical leave. Remember, I think we had a question on this prior to the webinar coming in when, at registration that you are not going to be able to force the use of PTO uh, during the waiting period before somebody's eligibility is determined. It's going to be something where the, the employee has to decide that they want to use their PTO for that uh, seven day period. So again, just keep that in mind, just making sure that everything is consistent and runs uh, seamlessly and concurrently is gonna be very important. Right, and so I'm gonna get, there's a lot of questions coming in on how does it work with other leaves. So we have a slide on that in a second. I'm just gonna spend a minute here and just to go over some questions that came in on the physical, some of the more administrative tasks. So Jen, I guess this is a question directly for you, but. So if a company, you know, you mentioned if someone wanted to to create their own policy but have it reviewed by legal counsel, that's obviously something that you could you could assist with, correct? You could be the legal counsel on the reviewing side. Yes, absolutely. And and whether it's myself or somebody else, I mean, it's if you want to take a stab at the drafting, many of you are very sophisticated in 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 policy drafting and reviewing policies and creation of policies. So you could certainly do that, and then you could have me give it a blessing. Um, and, and or some input on maybe some things that might be missing that might be less expensive. We typically bill hourly for a review like that and it may only take, you know, a half an hour or an hour to do something like that versus the creation of the policy, um, which obviously um, is a little bit different. And so let's talk about timing then. So obviously this is something you know, that, that theoretically should probably be done before the end of the year, but when would this have to make it out to employees by in, in a perfect world? Well, I would definitely say since it's effective January 1st, we would want to get it to, empo to employees on or before January 1st so that they have a chance to review it. And, um, and if you're updating the handbook in general, you want to make sure that you're getting it out prior to uh, that January 1st date if you're going to make it effective January 1st. I do want to mention that, you know, I have a client right now that's in the midst of litigation and it's, it's re related to a wrongful termination and the employee handbooks are all being produced in discovery. And in fact, I sat through a deposition last week of a HR manager and she was being grilled on the effective dates of her handbook and the fact that there were acknowledgements. Now, this one particular handbook had an effective date of April 1st and the acknowledgement was 3.30 the day before or the two days before, whatever it may be. And so this particular lawyer was arguing that this acknowledgement did not relate to this handbook because it's dated prior to. So again, um, you may want to make sure that on your acknowledgements, it says that, that the acknowledgement relates to the handbook in question, just because again, I'm seeing this in litigation right now. And this poor HR manager is, is saying that the, the acknowledgement relates to it, but the lawyer is badgering her. And also the, the HR manager is being questioned about the contents of this handbook and why certain things are in the handbook. And so, you know, unfortunately when things don't go well and an employee files suit, these policies can then be subject to scrutiny. So we wanna make sure they're well drafted on the front end. Yeah, and I think that was the biggest thing that I got out of our original conversation this week is, you know, thinking, okay, if, if I'm a business and someone goes out on leave in, you know, the second week in January and you haven't thought of some of these things, then whatever, you know, whatever happens there is precedent set moving forward. It might not necessarily be something that you wanted if you had the time to sit back and, and really think about it and come up with a plan around it. So I think the idea, you know, it kind of goes along with everything we've done this year through COVID and everything is just try our best to be proactive with it, make sure that we can get all of our questions answered beforehand. And I know we're going to get into other leaves, but there are, you know, it's, it obviously is a trickle down effect with other leaves as well. So um, before we get to the other leave slide, Jen, I know a question came in. So obviously, you know, we, we referenced specifically medical 
the medical plan has to be kept in place, but that's true with other benefits, correct? So if there's dental and vision and whatever else is there? Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, because I know that was the one question I had seen a bunch because, you know, obviously the medical plan, you know, is, is there. The one thing, a couple of questions coming in um, about prepaying their portion of the benefits. And, and this is something where if an employee has to, if an employee's out and they're sending a check for their benefits, et cetera, the one thing that, that I questioned was, well, normally those employees are contributing that on a pre-tax basis. So if an employee has to just cut a check for their medical insurance, et cetera, obviously that's post-tax money. And I know, Jen, you mentioned that, you know, if you wait for an employee to come back and do a catch-up, then obviously there's that risk that that employee might actually not come back. Um, but this question was, have an employee prepay the portion of benefits if they know, I guess that you would, you would kind of have to know how long the leave was if it was a pre-planned one. Um, yeah, exactly. That could be tough if it's a leave where you w weren't sure of the duration. Yeah, that might work for um, a bonding leave for the birth or adoption of a child because the individual may know I'm going out for X amount of weeks. But with a serious health condition, it, it might be more difficult. And so I would say if you're going to do that prepaid type of a situation, you really want to make sure your policy is well written as far as when that's going when when that people would be eligible to do that prepayment because i don't think all leaves would really be eligible for that because many leaves will be unknown as far as the length and duration right so this is this is a great question this is why i, I love doing these webinars and thank everyone on on the webinar so much for asking the questions but um you know because things come up that we don't think about but what about the retirement plan contribution so that's something i hadn't thought of that's another another pre-tax contribution for employees so if there's an employer, employer match for employee deductions. Um, my guess, actually, I'm not even going to guess. I'll let you answer how you think that would work. I don't think you're required to continue to make those contributions while someone's out on leave. Right, especially if it's a match, because obviously if they're not contributing, there's nothing to match. Okay, that's something... That's something, Jen, why don't we take that as a takeaway as well? We'll see if we can get something else on that because that's something, again, another great question we just didn't, that's something I didn't think of. Um, I think that, so there was there's there was one question that came in here that, that I think it's worth addressing now before we get into the leaves because it kind of speaks a little bit more about the administration, but um, I guess it's the overall theme of the question, I don't want to necessarily dive into too much details, but the overall theme is if you know if you can't spare an employee taking time off what are the reasons you could potentially deny this pfml leave and i and i think there are some specific consequences around that so i think it's you know can you deny a leave first of all i guess it's the first question and then if the answer is yes what what would be some of the reasons well that's a great question and i think you know it's it's so difficult to say yes or no, because everything, as we all know, is quite fact specific. And so obviously, if you have reason to suspect that the employee is fraudulently requesting a leave, for instance, the day before they are given a written warning and the next day they allegedly have to take care of a grandparent or you know something after July 1st, they'll be able to do that. Um, if you are very suspicious of the timing of the request, things like that, you can then let the department know that you have those concerns and the department can determine eligibility. Now, then you'll have to make a determination as to whether or not you're going to terminate the employee. Because remember, leave grant the, the granting of the leave is really going to be up to the department. And if somebody requests a leave, I would err on the side of granting the leave and waiting for the department to make their determination. But you also obviously have the option of terminating an employee. Now, as you all know, because you've heard of you've heard PFML has major retaliation provisions that are unlike any other law that we've ever seen as employ, employment lawyers. So we're very cautious about this. So unless you really feel like somebody has um, engaged in behavior that is you know, fraudulent or significant as far as theft, 
um, things like that, and you really have good grounds to let them go, I would suggest not doing so. Obviously, it's a case-by-case -case situation. You have to deal with every situation that's unique. But I would say you want to really make sure that you don't do that because they do have um, anti-retaliation provisions in this law, which go so far as to say that for six months after a claim is filed or a leave is taken, the individual is protected. And anything that the company does during that six-month period is presumed to be retaliatory. And the employer has the burden of proof that it is not retaliatory. And so that burden is going to be very high for the employer. Um, they're going to have to make their case by clear and convincing evidence that the termination was not retaliatory or the adverse action was not retaliatory. So be very careful, be very cautious. I would definitely err on the side of granting these leaves unless you consult with counsel and you make the determination that you have clear and convincing evidence. Okay, thank you, Janet. And a ton of questions are coming in, so I figured it's a good time to jump to this. So, so this was the big, um, this was kind of my big ask from from Jen to help help close some of the gaps. You know, I, th I think it makes sense to kind of go through some of this. This is overwhelming. Some of these leaves I had actually never heard of before. Obviously, I'm not necessarily in HR, so maybe that's not as surprising. But um, I, I think how these type of leaves coordinate with PFML has been the bulk of the questions that we've talked about, and then including PTO. And we're finding, you know, the PTO when we get there that there's, you know, a little bit different how the private carriers are handling it versus the state. But so Jen, do you want to try to help make some sense out of this slide, obviously, and then I'll, I'll kind of pipe in questions as we get there? Absolutely. So the obviously the first section at the top is the, the new Massachusetts PFML, and you see that <clears throat> employees are going to be eligible for up to 26 weeks in a benefit year of family leave and um, the, to care for their a family member and or for their own serious health condition. So medical leave is going to be 20 weeks for their own serious health condition. Family leave, which includes bonding leave and caring for a, a sick family member, is going to be 12 weeks. Remember, caring for a sick family member does not take effect till July 1st, 2021. So that is the leave under the Massachusetts PFML. The next is obviously FMLA. All employers that are larger than 50 um, have been familiar with FMLA and complying with FMLA. And so FMLA is 12 weeks unpaid and 26 weeks if it's to care for a service member, which obviously is, is not as prevalent and you may not have come across before. So you're very familiar with the 12 weeks of FMLA. Now, obviously, the new Massachusetts PFML has said that FMLA will run concurrently with PFML. So those leads can run concurrently. Now, one thing that needs to be addressed is you need to make sure that your benefit year in both PFML and FMLA are the same benefit year, because if not, they won't necessarily run concurrently. I do wanna make mention that FMLA requires you notify employees of a change in benefit year by giving them 60 days notice. So again, this is really important because the new law takes effect in just a few weeks, but you have to give 60 day notice for a, a benefit year change. Now, I don't know whether you already have the proper benefit year, and by proper, I just mean the one that PFML requires, because PFML requires a particular benefit year, and so I'm just um, going to tell you all exactly what the benefit year for PFML is, and that is the period of 52 consecutive weeks beginning on the Sunday immediately preceding the first day of job-protected leave. What that basically means is a forward-looking year. I don't know what your FMLA policy said, but again, you want to make sure if you do have to comply with FMLA that the benefit years are the same. So just keep that in mind as you're reviewing and revising your existing policy. The next one is MPLA, and that's the Massachusetts Parental Leave Act, and that was eight weeks unpaid leave. So again, that also runs concurrently with the Massachusetts Paid Family Leave Act. 
However, I do want to make mention um, on parental leave. Jeff and I, when we were speaking to a mutual client the other day, we were talking about their current parental leave. Now, they currently pay for a certain number of weeks of parental leave. So you may want to look at your current policy. Do you want to continue to pay and how much do you want to continue to pay now that there is this benefit that exists under PFML? And so those are the kinds of conversations and decisions that should be made before January 1st, 2021, if you currently have a parental leave policy that is paid. Did you want to chime in anything there, Jeff? Yeah, so I think, so a lot of really great questions are coming through. So Jen, I don't know if you'd rather me you know, a lot of them are talking about, you know, where, what's concurrent, what runs together with PFML. So I don't know if as you, I think I would rather have you go through just some the rest of them and, and then we'll get into there's some really, really specific, really good specific questions in here. So um, I think, why don't we try to get through these and then I'll start piping in the questions of coordination and what runs together with PFML and, and maybe just some, some, some questions that you that people may not be thinking of, like, like the one you just mentioned with the parental leave, where you know maybe you have to update a policy that's already in place right now um, with PFML coming. Okay, great. And so the next one is the Massachusetts domestic violence leave, which is 15 days. You'll see that starts after all the other paid leave, because it actually you you have to exhaust other paid leave, and and so that's why it kind of starts after the 26 weeks. So we don't imagine the cases of that are going to be very frequent because they would have already exhausted their other leave. The Massachusetts earned sick time, as you all know, in Massachusetts, you're required to provide up to 40 hours of sick time to your employees, both full and part-time. Um, and the part-timers can earn it one hour for every 30 hours worked. So obviously, as far as concurrent, this does not run concurrent. This is the only thing thus far that really is a little bit unique in the sense that you are not allowed to force somebody to exhaust their sick time before they apply for PFML. So they can maintain their sick bank even while going out on PFML or during that waiting period. So that's important to note. The next one is the Massachusetts Small Necessities Leave Act, which some of you may be familiar with. Again, it applies to all employers with over 50 employees. So anyone that was FMLA is usually familiar with the Small Necessities Leave Act. This is 24 hours of unpaid leave. Usually it's to attend medical appointments or to attend child-related um, school events and things like that. People don't use it much because usually they use paid time, so it's, it's not used very frequently, but it is there, so, so you can kind of see that. The next one is a reasonable accommodation under the ADA, and what, what we're seeing here is obviously after the 20 weeks of medical leave for PFML, someone may still be out on leave, and you're going to need to do a, you're going to need to make a determination as whether you need to continue to provide them a reasonable accommodation and continue the leave. And that will, again, be on a case-by-case -case basis. So you're not going to be able to say, oh, your 20 weeks is up, you're terminated. You're going to have to determine how much longer they need. Is it a reasonable request? Are they giving you a return to work date? You're going to have to make all those decisions to determine if they're requesting a reasonable accommodation at that point. So that's on a case-by-case -case basis. It would start after the 20 weeks of medical leave was up. Similarly, workers' comp is a case-by-case -case situation, but it would run concurrent with the applicable medical leave and reasonable accommodations. And then short-term disability. So, Jeff, I think you're going to be chiming in a little bit more on the interplay of short-term disability with PFML. Yeah, and absolutely. And that's another one that, that really is case-by-case. -case. So I have short-term disability in here as 13 weeks, but we know it can extend up to 26 weeks as well. And depending on how you, you're set up with carriers, I know a lot of people were thinking of getting rid of short-term disability and offering a buy-up. For those that are keeping short-term disability, hopefully you've seen a rate reduction uh, before the end of the year. If you haven't, you should definitely be asking for one. Um, but it does, it does definitely affect how, um, how the PFL coordinates with it. So Jen, before I get into questions, the one I definitely want to go over first is maternity. So that's the one where we're getting a lot of questions on how is the maternity leave handled? How is it handled with 
paid medical leave? How is it handled handled with paid family leave for bonding? Can we just go through a, a maternity situation? Sure, and I, I do also want to make mention that the department has come out and said that all births in the year uh, 2020 um, can potentially be eligible as of January 1st, 2021 for PFML, depending on when the birth occurred, as long as it's within 12 months of the time of the birth or adoption, the individual could be eligible for PFML in 2021. So that also brings up another question. Um, obviously, there's no requirement that you provide a specific notice right now. The department hasn't said that any other notice is necessary other than what you've already done. Um, as you all know, you're required to um, put up a poster. You're also required to give a written notice about PFML, and you're supposed to have employees sign that written notice. Hopefully, you've all done that because it was supposed to be done in September. Um, that's the only real requirement. Some employers have said, do I have to reach out to employees that had a baby in 2020 and say that you're eligible for this? There's no, to my knowledge, there's no requirement that you do so, but they, obviously, if they start coming to you for questions or if you want to, as a company, take the step that you'd like to know what your potential exposure is, do any of these people intend to actually use leave so you can make some plans? Obviously, you could reach out to them with that. And the department has said, regardless of what the individual used in 2020, even if they used 12 weeks or whatever they used, they are still going to be eligible in 2021 for that 12 weeks of bonding leave. And remember, this applies to both males and females that want to use bonding leave. So it's not just for maternity leave purposes, it's parental leave. So just be aware of that. You may see some cases from 2020 that are coming forward and seeking um, a benefit determination and an eligibility determination. So that certainly should be on your radar. The next yeah, thing is- Jen, one, I just wanted to add one quick thing. So for those who have exempted out of the state program into a private plan, which I think is probably a lot of people on the call, just make sure that the employees have the notice. I know we all remember there was the notice that was due at the end of last September. Um, just stating that you know PFML was coming and here's your that last page of the notice it had the deduction schedule on it just make sure that employees do know what their deduction is for 2021 so for anyone with a private plan something different within the state plan um, if you need the notice reach out you know we have a we have a kind of a notice that we've been using it's not perfect but at least it still has the the page where an employee understands that X amount is coming out of their paycheck you know, per paycheck for the pay family medical leave benefit. So if you need that, just reach out as well. We do have a copy of one of those. Great. Um, so Jen, do you want to do you want to go over the maternity thing, and then I, I think talk about a lot of questions on on what runs concurrently as well. So the, I know the maternity thing is a big one. So if someone has a baby planned, you know, January 10th of 2021, what is that going to look like for for PFML? Well, you know, Jeff, we still actually have some questions that are outstanding on that. And, and one of the things that I'm hoping the department provides us some guidance on is whether or not individuals that have the baby, the, the female that actually gives birth, whether or not they're going to be eligible for both um, to apply under the serious health condition and also to apply under the family bonding provision and whether or not that will extend their ultimate eligibility for longer than 12 weeks. So I'm hoping we get some guidance on that from the department. Um, we have heard that other states have allowed for something like that. Um, obviously, I think as employer counsel, we're hoping it's limited to just the 12 weeks um, after the birth and not obviously also for their own serious health condition, unless obviously there's something unusual about the birth where there is a medical complication. But for standard deliveries, we're hoping it is just the 12 weeks. So obviously if somebody comes to you and they're saying, hey, I, I, I'm due in January, if you are um, not a private plan uh, participant, you would point them to the department's website so basically in your policy, what I have in my model um, that I help people develop is how to file a claim. 
and it basically says that forms and claims instructions will be available on the department's website and it gives the department's website um, and then gives the the phone number for the department because obviously you are not the one dealing with that process if you're with a private carrier obviously the employer should be providing the contact information for the carrier and claim instructions for the carrier so that the individual can file that claim properly and make sure that they're determined eligible. And then obviously asking the questions as far as how long the, the individual intends to be out, those are perfectly appropriate questions. And when do they intend to return to work? All of those things should be asked uh, prior to the leave being taken. Again, you really want to have a notice process so the employee is notifying you, telling you the type of leave, the length of the leave, and their expected return date. Right. So if yeah, so I guess this is this is a question for an employee on short-term disability right now for maternity. You know, can they take bonding right after their short-term disability expires? And it would appear like that the answer to that question is is yes right now, because that would technically be a baby in 2020, correct? Then? So what? So what's the scenario, Jeff? The the employee is out on short term disability right now for maternity. For oh maternity right, leave. yeah, absolutely. If they're out right now on short term disability, in 2021 they will still be eligible for PFML for that same birth. Um, and then if they're still if the if the short term disability is still funding in January then that's a different situation as far as the offset between short-term disability and PFML. My understanding, and Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is the Massachusetts PFML offsets under a short-term disability program. Yeah, everything we're seeing is it looks like the paid medical leave is going to pay first. That's going to mm -hmm. be the first payer, and then short-term disability will come above and beyond that. If, you know, if there's someone Obviously, the mass paid leave is 80% to 850. So if someone's due more, it looks like the short-term disability will pay on top of that. Um, again, it depends on how you have your short-term disability set up. If, I think I think that goes into a bigger question of what does your short-term disability policy look like in 2021 compared to what it looked like in 2020. So that answer could be different depending on you know how how your short-term disability is set up. But um, it appears now that if it's set up as just a company paid. The, the PFML is going to pay for it first. STD will pick up anything above and beyond the 850 as to what an employee's do. Um, that, that's what it appears to look like so far right now. So, Jen, a couple of questions coming in on, on FMLA in the birth of a child. So, if an employee de decides to go through FMLA, would then they have the ability to go through PFML? You know, FMLA is obviously 12 weeks. Would they be able to go through PFML to get an additional eight weeks? Through the state program um, for the birth of a child, so that I think they're referring to the 20 Obviously, weeks of the, the, yeah, medical, I mean, leave, the medical leave. So typically, what we would envision is for. FMLA is that it would run concurrently with PFML. Now, obviously, if, if the birth of the child occurred in 2020, it's a little bit different. But say if there's a birth in 2021, your FMLA and your PFML are going to run concurrently. The only issue then becomes the benefit year and whether or not there's a few months that aren't quite overlapping because your FMLA benefit year might be different than your PFML benefit year. So that's why we want to make sure that those benefit years are the same, because if not, there could be a few months that you're kind of at expo you have exposure for somebody taking FMLA when they've already taken PFML. Right. And so I'm going to go through. So we have a bunch of questions here, so I'm going to go through them. But you want to I've seen a couple on PTO. So do we want to talk about, you know, will an employee be able to use vacation time, PTO time and how it's how it's handled around? PFML? Yes, this is such a big, important question. And initially, we were all giving the advice that yes, you would be able to. And so, um, FYI, advice is changing. So, I just want to let everybody know that the department has issued new guidance based on the regulations that were issued, the last and final regulations that were issued. And the new guidance and the, regu and the regulations explicitly state that you are not allowed to top off the PFML 
So say your max benefit is $850 that the employee is receiving from the state. The employer is not allowed to top off that benefit by allowing the employee to exhaust PTO. That's an important change because a lot of people were planning on allowing the use of vacation and or PTO time and or whatever bank they use and allowing them to top off. The department has issued a FAQ and explicitly said that that is not going to be allowed. Now, what I will say, and what's interesting, is private carriers, some of them are allowing this. So again, it's dependent on the carrier, but check with your carrier to see if this is something that's allowed because carriers, there are carriers out there that are saying, we're going to be more generous and we're going to allow, we're going to pay the employee and we're going to let you top them off. Now, again, you should never allow the employee to make more than they would have otherwise made when they weren't working. So that's an important consideration. But um, this is an important component and we want to make sure that you're all complying with this because it really could jeopardize someone's benefits if you're paying them or allowing them to top off while they're out on leave. Well, a couple of quick questions around just holiday pay, and I think you just hit some of it, um, as you know, PTO, et cetera, but what about the accrual? So are those, are those still accruing if someone's holiday pay, PTO, is that still accruing if someone's out on benefits? So that's another good question, and the regulations state that you do not have to allow the accruals to continue while someone's out on leave, so you don't have to have a pay stub that shows that the accruals are continuing. However, when they come back, they are not, um, their, their benefit eligibility, including accruals, should not be changed in any way that's negative. So if they were allowed to, allowed to accrue three weeks of PTO, obviously when they return, they're still eligible to accrue three weeks of PTO. Now, they may not accrue it because they were out for 10 weeks or however many weeks, but their eligibility remains the same. So we wanna make sure that's very important and key because if not, it's a retaliation issue. But you do not have to track or accrue it while somebody is out on leave, which actually was changed during the regulations at some point, which is very helpful to employers because it would have been difficult if they weren't being issued paychecks and things like that to keep track of all of that. So let's, let's talk about leaves people who are out on any one of these leaves right now heading into 2021 for something that could theoretically be a be allowed under the PFML regulation. So how are those leaves, what's gonna happen when one, one, one flips over? What are, what are all of those, how is that gonna be coordinated moving forward? Yeah, I think very similar to the pregnancy issue, I think those individuals should be informed that they can apply for leave under the private plan or under the, the state plan, depending on which the employer participates in. And they should be provided contact information for either the carrier or the Commonwealth, depending on which the applies in the scenario. And then the employee can file that claim and, and they may be eligible for an additional 20 weeks if they're out on a medical leave. Or, uh, and again, remember, family leave doesn't start, not, not the bonding leave, but caring for a family member till J July of 2021. So they're not going to be able to make those requests. So if right now they're out doing that, it's just going to be FMLA that applies. So don't, don't worry too much about that. But serious health conditions, if they're out right now, obviously they could roll that over. And I think that the department's going to take a similar approach where they're going to be eligible for the full amount um, during 2021 of 20 weeks, despite the, the fact that they may have taken FMLA in 2020. Because again, remember, it, the, the concurrentness does not start until... PFML actually is in effect. And so I think that that's why it's, it's going to be concurrent, but it's not going to be concurrent until 2021. So Jen, a couple questions coming in around PFML and workers' comp. So someone's out on workers' comp, who pays first? How does, how does it work in coordination with workers' comp? I, I'm not really sure exactly what's going to happen there, but what I suspect will happen is that workers' comp, if it is a, if it is determined a legitimate work injury, is going to be the first payer. 
that's what I had understood as well, just from even like from the information with the, the private carriers. Um, so that's another FMLA one. Um, so just a couple of the FFCRA has come up a couple times. You just want to touch on that. I know we haven't gotten any guidance on the FFCRA continuing or as, it, as of right now, it, it doesn't appear that it is, but if it does, can you just spend a minute on that, Jen? Absolutely. So obviously most of you know the Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, expires on 12-31-2020. Um, and so we really don't know <laughs> what's going to happen uh, if, it, if it will be extended. I, I know this morning I read they're still deadlocked, so I, I don't know. And I, I honestly, I don't know if the package that they're debating even has a provision to extend FFCRA. I haven't looked that far, and I haven't heard that it does. So just be aware that the um, extension may not occur, meaning FFCRA may end in December of 2020. If it is extended, though, I do want to just state, if it is extended until 2021, then there may be some interplay between FFCRA and PFML. It would only occur if the FFCRA leave was used for sick leave purposes, because remember, the other weeks that you can uh, use it for are child care purposes, which would not be a PFML uh, eligibility area. So you're not eligible for PFML when a school or daycare closes, but you're eligible for FFCRA if a school or daycare closes. So the only way that there would be overlap is for sick leave for COVID for the 80 hours. Now, remember, your eligibility for PFML if you're sick is up to 20 weeks. So that 80 hours in the 20 weeks, there could be some overlap. Now, also remember the first seven days of PFML are not paid. So I would imagine that certainly FFCRA would pay for the first 40 hours. And then it would, it would depend on how, you know, how they determine what happens after that, whether it's FFCRA or PFML. Obviously, FFCRA had tax credits that went along with them. And so it may be more advantageous to the employer to pay that sick leave for COVID reasons under FFCRA, and then the employee would then be eligible if COVID-related illness extended, they would be eligible to apply for PFML for their own serious health condition. So one question that's come in a couple of times, and, and this, this might be more what you think for best practices, but the management of of this whole thing. So obviously, this this chart on here is is a full time job, um, being able to understand, manage all this. But have you seen anything best practices on managing this, even managing down to like the intermittent leave, where that that's really the nitty gritty of it? Have you seen anything from your clients um, that that are best practices for that? Well, just having a point of contact, having good policies in place. Some companies do decide to outsource leave management. And I know, Jeff, you, you work with a leave management company that does some of that work for some of your clients that are very large. So I think key points would be managing this on the front end, making sure you have good policies, making sure you have good procedures so you know how you're going to manage these leaves and how they all inter interplay. But again, most of these leaves, everything pretty much is going to run concurrent with PFML. There's not much that doesn't, except for you cannot force the use of the sick leave or PTO vacation. Um, so that's going to be something that the employee has to want to use. So again, keep that in mind. So there, there are a bunch of good questions in here that I, I see as probably more one-off scenarios. So some of these questions I'll take off and I'll I'll shoot answers to these and I can loop in Jen if, if we need to. Um, so to go along with the, the, the FFCRA question quickly, but so someone would, would they be eligible for PFML if they needed for, for COVID issues or so quarantines due to COVID? They would not be eligible for quarantines due to COVID. They would only be eligible for their own serious health condition. So if they contracted COVID and it lasted more than the 80 hours that the FFCRA covers and they were hospitalized, let's say, for a month, 
clearly that would be their own serious health condition and they would be eligible for PFML under that circumstance. Um, and I, I know we talked about forcing people to use certain leave, so we know that we can't force the sick leave, but can you, quote unquote, force an employee to use like vacation time? And I, I guess that probably goes along with vacation PTO time. The answer to that is no, correct? Correct. Okay, excellent. Um, a couple questions here that relate to, so just going back to the handbook quickly. So for the PFML policy, does it need to does it need to have its own like section in the handbook? Is it an amendment to the handbook? Does the whole handbook have to be redone? You know, it, it really depends on how you usually do these things at your company. Um, you can obviously send out a, a PFML policy that's a standalone policy. You could send out a handbook that's been amended that includes an, a new PFML section. It really depends how you typically keep your policies, how you distribute them, and uh, you want to be consistent with what you've done in the past. Obviously, I like one handbook with all policies in it because it's just streamlined. It's easier. Um, if there is litigation that arises, we can say, okay, give me the handbook, which contains all the policies. We're not pulling different you know, 20 different documents together because we only need that one. So obviously, you know, from a legal perspective, I think it's nice just having one handbook. But if you're the type that just has a few standalone policies, that's completely fine. And you could do this as a standalone policy. So it's, again, it's personal preference. It's how you run the business. Be consistent with what you've done in the past. Um, and when you issue this, you can do it electronically. You can, you can hand them out. Obviously, if you're doing a handbook amendment, we'd like those acknowledgement forms, again, because it's important that the employee received that handbook and we can prove it um, at the time if there's an issue or litigation arises. So, and similarly, if you're just going to do a standalone policy, I would recommend having a signature page on it. Okay. And so, I would normally take this one offline, but it's actually been a couple of schools have jumped on and, and asked questions around. PFML and FMLA um, when it comes to like school breaks. So does PFML take into consideration those same things that FMLA does for from a school standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but those those breaks typically wouldn't be considered working time. So it would typically extend the leave another week. I, and I don't know what the school's policy on that is, but that's something that we could always address separately. Okay. Yeah, because there were a couple of questions that came in. It was just, I think, specifically to that of, you know, the questions of when schools were on break. And I, I think you answered that, but it sounds like that might be a little bit uh, more of a deep dive. So I know it is right at 11 o'clock now. So we still have some questions. I still plan on asking them for those who can't stay on, thank you for joining. Um, and what we obviously will get, um, we'll get the recording out as quickly as we can with some of the answers. Um, but I, I do, Jen, if you still have time, I still like to run through a couple, a couple of the questions that have come in, um, come in since, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so em employees that's on workers comp into 2021, are they required to do a PFML claim at the same time? A lot, I, I, we've gotten a couple questions saying, can you basically, can you choose to do one of these or not? Like, so can you pick to do this one versus this one? Can you do PFML? Can you not do it and pick something different? So I think this yeah, kind of I mean, ties into that's that. a good question. And I think obviously the workers comp one, I think that the claim would remain with workers comp. I don't think that they're going to be eligible for PFML because I think workers comp is going to be the first payer in that situation. Obviously, if something happened where they were no longer eligible for workers comp, potentially they could then apply for PFML. So keep that in mind. Um, remember that even former employees can apply for PFML. Uh, and so it's kind of interesting, uh, up to I believe 26 weeks after their employment, they can file claims. So it's totally unique on that, on that end. Um, but I do wanna mention that you should have something that states if the, if the employee for whatever reason decides to use vacation time for their knee surgery, instead of applying for PFML, you want your policy to state that any and all time used that's, that could be considered PFML eligible will, be, will, will apply toward their allotment. So that way they can't come back and say, well, I took two weeks 
and I, I, I took my vacation, but now I want 20 more weeks. They would then be limited to, the, to 18 weeks if they had already taken two paid weeks for their own serious health condition. The reason why some people might not want to file a claim is because they get paid in full if they use their own time versus filing a claim, they're going to get a max, uh, maximum of $850. So there could be occasions where somebody's going to be out for a health condition and they'd prefer to use their own claim, their own time, and that's completely fine. You just want your policies to reflect that that time is going to be counted toward their allotment. Okay. Um, one quick question that's come in on this, this slide that we're actually looking at. So do we, Jen, do you think, and this might be something you and I can do as a takeaway, but um, taking this slide away and do, is there something that includes just these types of leaves as well as the amounts and formulas, how to calculate them, and et cetera? Do you know of anything? I think it speaks to probably a, a greater need on just leaves, what's available for employees in general, but um, is it something that we could potentially put some some dollar figures to this and some just to, to help to try to coordinate it all into one place? Well, I mean, the FMLA is going to be an unpaid leave. The parental leave is an unpaid leave. Obviously, the sick time is the 40 hours of paid leave. So the and then PFML, of course, is paid and you have that cap of eight hundred and fifty dollars. So, I mean, there's, there's there's definitely charts that exist that compare the federal and Massachusetts leave laws and to the extent people need further breakdown of, you know, what applies to under 50 employees, what applies to over 50 employees, um, who would be eligible under those leaves, things like that. To the extent people need more information on uh, these leaves and how they, they differ, um, you know, certainly feel free to reach out to Jeff or myself and we can walk you through a little bit more about the differences between the leaves. But hopefully we've given you a good overview of them. Yeah, and Jen, this one goes into a, a conversation that we kind of had the other day. But for, for those companies that are looking to continue to pay employees, so continuing to pay their salary, deductions for, for you know, retirement, all that stuff, are they able to collect just the, the PFML is obviously contributory as well. Are they able to just collect the PFML from the employee directly? And I think, you know, my guess is that kind of goes back to a more macroeconomic conversation around what do we want our policy to look like? Exactly. I agree. Um, okay. Um, so this one is a little bit more specific. Um, so for if an employee is out on leave and a holiday goes by, are you required to pay the holiday time for that employee? So no, not usually. Um, and again, it, obviously it depends on what kind of leave it is, but all the leaves that are on here, it, you know, if somebody's out on a leave, they're not eligible for holiday pay um, because they're not working. They're, they're literally on leave. Um, obviously you could always put in your holiday pay section. You have to be working and not on leave in order to be eligible for holiday pay. Just if you want to be completely clear about it. If you've had an issue before where people were out on leave and they're calling and saying, well, I didn't get paid for my, you know, Thanksgiving. I, I want that one day pay. Um, you could certainly make sure that your policy is, is crystal clear, but just generally speaking, it's, it would be very unusual to pay somebody for a holiday when they're on leave. Okay. And this one goes back. It's kind of similar to the teacher question, but this is for, for union based companies. So obviously the employees are getting a per hour amount based on how much they're working, but if they aren't, if they have a scenario where there are no hours worked, should they be kept active for these benefits? For which benefits, Jeff? The, the PFML. Oh, so obviously if they have no hours worked, um, you know, they, if they're out on leave, then they're going to be potentially eligible for benefits through that. If they if they have no hours worked and they're not getting paid, you're not making any deductions on their behalf, I would imagine, through payroll. 
Right. I think, and I think this goes back to obviously PFML. I think it goes back to what's, what's ineligible, what's a person who's eligible to take leave. So, you know, if they're not working any hours in general over the course of the year, then, then that's different than someone who just has a week where they don't work any hours, but overall they're, they're averaging, you know, 20 hours a week, whatever the case may be. Right. Exactly. I mean, remember an employee is eligible for PFML if they have earned a rec the requisite amount, um, they must have worked 15 weeks or more and have earned at least approximately $5,000 in the previous 12 months. Um, and again, so they don't they don't have to necessarily be working every single week, but that's the the general eligibility requirement. Right, and there are, so there are a bunch of specific short-term disability questions here, and. I don't necessarily want to ask, I think what I'm going to do for those who ask questions about short-term disability, you know, either myself or if you're working with, with one of the other two benefits guys, John Turco, John Foley, I'll probably refer you back to them and, and we'll, we'll reach out for you just because the answer to the question is really specific to the policy that you have in place. And it might even, depending on what you want to do, it might even uh, require a change in what you're doing moving forward to accomplish whatever your goal is. So again, just the, the conversation around short-term disability has to be really specific to what you want to do. So keeping a company paid short-term disability policy as it is right now, again, you should be getting a lower rate. It should, PFML should be paying first. The short-term disability, if an employee is eligible for it, should be paying above and beyond that. Um, but again, it really does depend on how that policy is set up. And ideally, hopefully, you've gone with a private carrier and your short-term disability policy is with that same private carrier. So all of that coordination happened behind the scenes. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure if those are the cases there, but I, I think it makes sense just to reach out to some of those, uh, some of those directly, um, just so that there's no, there's no confusion. So this is a scenario, Jen, that I just wanted to go through. So Someone was out on FMLA, they're 12 weeks, exhausted 12, 16. So they're, they're, they've exhausted their FMLA. Um, the plan was to initially terminate that employee, but based on that look back for PFML, how it goes back six months with a terminated employee, would she be able to apply for that PFML benefit if she was terminated in 2020? I believe the answer is gonna be yes. Okay. It's going to be 26 weeks from the termination date. So I think that they're going to allow individuals that were terminated in 2020 to potentially file claims in 2021. But I, I haven't seen a FAQ on that yet. I'm hoping as we get closer to January and then once January comes, we'll get some good FAQs from the department on some of these different scenarios. But my inclination is they're going to allow prior, because again, eligibility specifically states um, that the individual can be unemployed for 26 months, uh, 26 weeks rather, and they can still be eligible if they meet the yeah, other so criteria. The, it'll be interesting because, you know, if, if that were me, I would, I would go back and say, so that's basically saying someone who got fired anytime July and beyond of 2020, they could file for PFML in 2021. I would make the argument that the benefits didn't exist in July of 2020. So how are they filing for a benefit that didn't exist when they've been termed for six months? So that'll be interesting to hear, to hear what the, the answer to that is. Right. I do think it would be difficult for them to bring a retaliation provision, uh, claim against the company for that termination that happened in 2020, because again, um, the claim wasn't filed and the eligibility wasn't determined until 2021 and the termination happened the year before. So it would be really hard to link the two. And so, Jen, have you heard anything more about the state claims portal, state claims process? I haven't, I have not seen the state claims form yet. Um, I know some of the private carriers out there have outlined their process for filing claims. It sounds like it's going to be heavily employee driven, pre preferably via the telephone. Um, that, that's how the private carrier is going to look to be doing it. But have we heard anything about the state, the state portal and are they ready to roll? You know, I haven't, the last I heard, they said they were going to be um, getting out the claim form and, and, and having that online, but I haven't seen, I haven't seen that actually posted yet. 
So hopefully soon, because obviously uh, initially there was some news that they were going to allow births to be filed in, in December that happened in 2020. And they ultimately, they, they took that down off the website. So clearly they made a determination that they weren't ready to, to receive those types of claims. So um, I haven't seen any claim form yet. Obviously, if it does come out, we'll certainly share it on social media for those that are looking for it. Okay, and then Jen, just kind of any any last, I, I know the idea is to try to get in front of things so that if an employee goes out on leave that, that you know, an employer looks back and says, oh, I wish I would have changed X, whatever that may be. Any last, just based on the conversations you're having, based on things that you're hearing, just things from a high level, just to, to look out for as, a, as an employer when you're ultimately thinking about how you're going to manage PFML moving forward, thinking about how you're potentially going to change policies in place, any just sort of best practices? I would say just make sure your policies are in order. Um, the department has uh, put forward a employer account that you're supposed to create. So that's going to be where you access applications and submit information. So to the extent you haven't created your employer account, go ahead and do that. Just make sure you have all your ducks in a row before that January 1st, 2021 date. Okay. Well, there a bunch of awesome questions. Again, there were questions that came in that seem more one-off, so we didn't forget about you. We're just gonna, um, we, we might just take them offline and shoot you over a note just to, to see if we can help through whatever the scenario that, that you're going through. So again, Jen's information is down at the bottom there. You can either reach out to myself or Jen. Um, I know a couple of people have, have asked questions, asking to be connected to Jen, um, post the webinar, so we can absolutely do that. Um, for either writing the policy from scratch or if you have something, you know, if you were provided a policy somewhere, whether it be you're writing it on your own, you pulled it off of a, a partnership website, and you're wondering if this is going to be good enough for you, that's where I think, you know, Jen can absolutely, um, she can absolutely do that review for you and, you know, have the conversation of, of whether this seems like it's going to work or, or you know, it, maybe you need to make an update to it. Well, Jen, as always, thank you. Um, I know this is a little impromptu, but after our conversation, I thought it was important to get some of this information out there. So if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to reach out. We'll do our best to answer everything. Um, and uh, obviously, thank you very much. Thanks for joining Thanks us. For thank you, Jen. All right. Take care. Bye.